Hello humans, welcome to my guide to force vector design using FVD++. I hope to provide you an approachable method to creating roller coasters using this software with a bit of know-how and guidance. From time to time, I will include engineering and mathematical concepts to help aid in understanding the connection between the user inputs and the resulting output in a deeper way. I won't be covering these topics too in-depth, as we just need a surface level understanding of the broader concepts to help with demonstrating force vectors, the core to FVD. I'll quickly cover the basics of the software for those unfamiliar. The top bar contains the usual suspects, file to save, load, and export your projects, edit to perform history commands, as well as adjust the GUI to your liking. Visualize allows us to see different aspects of the coaster, and help provides a handy conversion table as well as heartline values for various ride types, a topic we will cover in depth in a later episode. The project tab shows all of the tracks in the project, allowing you to add a new track, delete a track, edit the selected track in a new window, or change the properties of the selected track. Let's take a look at the properties of this track. The friction parameter and friction coefficient determine how much the coaster slows due to friction, but in a simpler way than how No Limits handles it. For now, I'll leave these alone, as this will work well with the example coaster we'll be designing before the end of the episode. This topic will be covered later though. For now, let's change the track style to B&M, and uncheck the wireframe box. This will give us a 3D rendered spline in the appropriate style. There are many other options to choose from as well. The heartline height is also set correctly for the example coaster, so we'll leave that. Before we can begin designing our first roller coaster, we should take some time to understand reference frames and force vectors and how they work together, specifically within the FVD++ software to create the spline of the roller coaster. Force vector design is done using a piecewise temporal graph incorporating the normal and lateral forces in conjunction with the roll rate. This is a mathy way to say that we use various shapes on a graph to tell the software how much force should be applied to the roller coaster in the vertical and horizontal directions and how much it is rotating as time ticks on. By manipulating the shape, amplitude, and duration of these individual math functions, we can direct the track where we want it to go. But before we get into how to manipulate these graphs, we should cover what force vectors are. Force vectors are the meat and potatoes of FED++. They are in the name, after all. To put it simply, a force vector is a line in 3D space that has a direction and a magnitude. We say magnitude instead of length here because we are representing the strength of an applied force. As the force grows, so does the vector. And as the direction of the force changes, so will the vector's direction. The force vectors that we use in FED++, namely the normal and lateral, are attached to a reference frame, another mathy term, this time describing a simple set of x, y, z axes. We attach the normal force to the up axis and the lateral force on the axis sticking out to the side. A force is also attached to the x axis, the one pointing forward on the roller coaster. This is the acceleration of the roller coaster and is calculated automatically given the inputs on the graph and the effects of the force of gravity, without which the coaster would never speed up or slow down. Even though we know that gravity is constant and always pointing down, our reference frame is very much not constant or always pointing down. So from the point of the view of the roller coaster, or the reference frame, the gravity force vector is changing direction when the roller coaster changes direction. Gravity can be easy to forget since it is not represented in the same way as other input forces. We should keep it in mind though, as it can cause issues in shaping in certain instances. I will show in more detail the effects gravity can have on different shapes you are trying to make, and give some possible solutions to make your ride smoother and bring your shaping closer to what is done on real engineered roller coasters. This method of using force vectors makes for a clean and fast way to create your roller coaster designs. Some trial and error is always going to be a factor, but with some practice and understanding, changing the shapes of the graph to influence the shape of the roller coaster can become second nature. Roller coaster design in general, after all, is at least in part an art form. The example coaster I will be using today is a B&M Hyper Coaster. Larger roller coasters can be easier to create given how drawn out the elements typically are. So it will be easier to show good versus bad shaping and how to correct odd shaping whenever it does pop up. But before we can get into the meat and potatoes, we have to get the roller coaster to the top of the lift. The station, lift, and brake sections of our roller coaster will be done using simple straight and curved segments instead of the four sections, hopefully for obvious reasons. 
This is simple and straightforward, but I do want to highlight a few things here and there to help polish up your rides, so let's walk through it. We start with a straight segment. This is going to consist of the final block break, the station, and a smaller transfer section just before the chain lift. A very common station setup and where you'll start most of your projects. Multiple straight segments in FED++ don't translate exactly to no limits whenever we export the track. The strict node placement gets lost somehow. You can manually fix this, but it's best to combine our straight segment lengths and use a single straight segment in FED++ as we aren't always going to be on the grid, making the hand adjustments more imprecise. So, 16 meters for the brakes, 16 for the station, and 5 meters for the transfer, totaling 37 meters. The bottom of the lift is a curved segment rotated to a direction of 0 degrees to get it curving upward. We want a tight radius and a snappy lead-in and lead-out to more closely match the ride's IRL counterparts. The lead-in and lead-out values correspond to how much of the entrance and exit of the curve is smoothened out. Values of 0 will produce a perfect segment of a circle, making the track instantly snap upwards. We want the lead-in and lead-out to be fast and snappy, but not instant. Also, these two values added together cannot exceed the total angle of the curve. Next is a straight segment extended far enough to get to the height we are looking for, about 64 meters. The X, Y, Z readout shows the location of the end of the currently highlighted segment, so we use the Y value to know we have reached our peak. By the way, I am using the scroll wheel on all of these input boxes to quickly change the value instead of typing it in. The shift key can be used to create larger increments, and the control key can be used to create more fine increments. I like to set the speed of the straight part of my lifts to 100 kilometers or so, so I can quickly skip the lift whenever I move the camera to the rails and ride the ride. We do so by pressing the spacebar, moving forward and backward on the track by using the W and S keys. Shift and control in conjunction do exactly what we expect here, as they speed up and slow down how fast we move through the track. The top of the lift is another curved segment. This time we rotate the segment downward by setting the direction to 180 degrees. A track radius between 10 and 14 meters is more appropriate here, and a more gentle lead in and lead out can be used. To pull the track up into a small trim before the first drop, we use one last curve segment, again with a tight radius and a fast lead in and lead out. We're almost ready to dive into the fourth segment, but first we need to determine the right speed to start the segment. I have found that it is best practice to create a drop similar to the one you have in mind, and then export the track and test it within the simulator. Pull up the ride stats using F2 and pause the ride when the center of the train crosses the end of the segment before your fourth section. We will use this speed for the segment prior in FED++. Now, back to FED++ and we're ready to start manipulating this fourth section. The start of the fourth section will always maintain the initial conditions from the previous segment. Here, we started with a flat straight section, so a flat straight section continues. If our track was curved beforehand, those starting conditions would affect our track straight away. I want to focus only on the normal force for now, so I will set the roll and lateral force to dynamic and hide both of them from the graph using the graph list tab. This allows them to stretch with the changing normal force while maintaining no change in the magnitudes of lateral force and roll rate. In FED++, we have a variety of shapes to choose from, but the cubic and cortex shapes will be our go-to for the majority of the design process. There are applications where I found the sinusoidal shape to be useful, but it is rare. And the quadratic shape can be helpful when blending geometric and force sections together, a more complicated technique I will get into in a later episode. Let's use a cubic shape to start the drop. Intuitively, lowering the magnitude starts to dip the ride down. Once we get to zero Gs, the ride is on a freefall trajectory, namely a parabolic trajectory. At the end of this curve, gravity is the only force acting on the ride. We extend this with another segment with no magnitude to create our drop. As fun as freefalling is though, we have to pull up at some point. Another cubic function can be used to get the ride curving back upwards by using positive force. This can again be extended to give us an idea of where we want to place the valley of this first drop. Extending the freefall part of the curve lowers the value of the drop, and, consequential to the greater speed now taken by the ride, the shape of the valley also changes. With the value of the drop where we want it, we can put in another cubic function going to zero Gs to start the first airtime hill. I'll extend the length of the valley segment until the pitch at the end of the ride is around 60 to 65 degrees. 
Extending this reveals our airtime hill. I find this entrance angle at this height to produce a very nice parabolic airtime hill, creating that classic B&M parabolic peak that whips riders over the crest. We can change the tightness at the top by extending the valley segment or reducing it. I like to fine tune my hills until the peak hits a lowest speed of 36 km per hour. This makes a curve that is both tight and also has enough speed that variations in ride conditions that affect the speed won't be detrimental to the final product if it were to be constructed. As is, this method of using cubic segments and constant segments will certainly get the job done and can be a quick way to throw together concepts when shaping isn't as important, and it has done well in showing the basics of FBD for us here. But we can do a lot better. Remember that the way gravity is affecting the ride is changing as the ride changes direction. This has had a drastic impact on the shaping of the valley on our first drop. With the camera placed along the side of the train in the simulator, we notice that the track pumps as it enters and exits the valley. I like to call this a double pump as the track seems to pump twice before finishing the element. This shaping can be ugly at best and uncomfortable at worst, so let's address it. Looking at the track from the side view, we can superimpose a circle with about the same radius as the valley of the drop and visually see how the track is pumping. The radius of the valley gets tighter, loosens, and then gets tighter again before leveling out into the hill. In order to get the ride closer to a circular valley and remove this pump, we'll have to adjust our approach while keeping gravity in mind. We can opt for a perfect circle or a valley that gradually gets tighter and starts to loosen after the middle of the valley. Either way, we'll produce a better result than what we have here. I'll shoot for a tighter, more circular valley this time. The shape of the graph in FED++ we're looking for now is similar to the one we built previously, but we want the introduction of forces to be more smoothly applied to counteract the gradually changing force of gravity. We go to the quartic function then, and increase the magnitude to the same as we had before. We'll never be able to simply extend this out, so we look to one of the most powerful tools in the software, hidden in plain view, the center and tension values. The tension value squishes and stretches the function accordingly, and the center value moves the center of the function to the left or right on the graph. Stretching the quartic function out a bit makes the curve more similar to the cubic setup we had before, but the forces continue to be applied gradually and smoothly. Finding the best value for the tension is the challenge then. I like to start with a higher than necessary value, something that comes close to what I can imagine the shaping should be. I will then run the same pump test by placing the in-game camera again at the back of the train and looking for pumps. If lowering the tension value and repeating the process improves things, I will keep going until the valley is sufficiently smooth. Once we pass the point where the valley is mostly circular, we start to see the train take on a slightly different motion. Now, we see that it will gradually get tighter until the very bottom of the valley and then gradually loosen into the airtime hill. This is what we call a single pump and is generally acceptable, though in this case, not ideal. So I will be using the more circular valley for this example. Visually, we can see that the end of the quartic function is slightly lower than the start of the function. Knowing that the function is symmetric when our center is zero, we know that the absolute highest magnitude of the function is not at the very bottom of the valley. We want this point to be at the bottom of the valley though, since this is where gravity has the greatest effect on our normal force inputs as it is in direct opposition. I'll move the center forward slightly to compensate. You'll never get this exactly on the nose without more intense math work, but knowing that we need to nudge it over is enough to smooth out the valley to the point our eyes won't notice. Writing this in the simulator, we can see how much better things have gotten from this simple technique. Using a cortex section for the valley isn't the end-all be-all though, and it can cause issues if we want anything other than an airtime hill after the segment. For instance, if we want to throw in a trim break before the next airtime hill, we get some odd shaping going into it because the normal force on the straight segment is not zero g's. Highlighting the straight segment, we can see the y acceleration, this is our normal force, that we need to end the valley on in order for a smooth transition into the straight segment. You could use the overshoot final value setting for the quartic function, but I find that to be finicky and difficult to work with accurately, especially when the end value is less than 1g. So instead, I will be using two cubic functions to mimic what the quartic function is doing. Instead of using the tension like before, we use the center to move both cubic functions out to closely match our previous quartic. The second cubic function will come down to around 0.5g's to match the straight segment normal force. When you change the force of the last cubic function before the straight, the angle changes slightly, 
and so then does the normal force of the straight segment. So going back and forth isn't very helpful here. Instead, I will fine tune these values until the graph visually lines up and is at the angle I want for the entrance to the airtime hill. In order to maintain our speed, we need to uncheck the fixed speed box of the straight segment. Our airtime hill can be easily made by lowering the first cubic function to 0 g's and extending it out like before. Again, we are looking for faster than 36 kilometers per hour at the peak. So we make the similar adjustments to the valley previous to change the angle until we get the desired parabolic peak. We've got some great airtime hills going, but if we keep going in this direction, it will be a very long time before we get back to the station, and we'll probably need some boosters along the way. We'll tackle this problem next time though, when I take a deep dive into how FVD++ handles rolling. This is one of the most difficult aspects of force vector design since the roll, unlike the forces, is handled as a rate over time. So I want to dedicate an entire video to just this concept. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, be safe, be healthy, be kind. Oh wait, before you go, a quick word about these BNM Airtime Hill peaks. Do not do this. A quartic function at the peak to more quickly snap the train over the top of the hill is not the way to get this shaping. Okay, okay, I'm not the arbiter of roller coaster shaping, and you are free to be as creative as you like. Doing this could certainly be a good technique for the right ride, but I am 99% sure that B&M has never done this on any of their airtime hills. I see why people do it though. We feel this peak as ejector airtime a lot, because when ridden from the front row, the train is moving faster than what we prescribed in FVD++. Since in FVD++, we are tracking the train's speed from the center of the train. We should keep this in mind anytime we have tighter transitions where the speed variation can be quite a lot from the front car to the middle car crossing the same point. This can cause the g-forces in the front car to be painful, so we try to keep both of these in mind while working from the middle. Okay, goodbye for real this time. Be good, y'all.